Who are some of the worst convicted pastors? Let's get right into it. Number three, preaching real estate. Larry Hawley, a pastor at Abundant Life Ministries in Flint, Michigan, ran a scam that involved convincing longtime members to invest in real estate with him, then lying about where the money was going. The prominent community figure hustled no small number of churchgoers, and unlike most Ponzi schemes, many of those he swindled never saw a penny back on their investment. Larry Hawley has never been in it alone. From the scam's supposed 2014 beginning, Patricia Gray has been there. Sources don't go too deep into how the pair met, calling Gray a paid associate. It can be assumed that they met through Hawley's position in the church. With Gray by his side, Hawley would hold blessed life conferences to find suckers. The duo would go from church to church across America to convince retirees and other vulnerable folk to hand over their cash, which went into an account tied to Holly's business. He would pray with the churchgoers and tell them that God wants them to invest. The two came to these conferences prepared with tons of fraudulent materials showing things like real estate that they managed, checks showing payouts to investors, and statements showing cash flowing into the business. With all this evidence, Holly finished strong with an appeal to faith. Sowing your seed for your need is an extremely common idea in evangelical Christianity, so nobody batted an eye. The idea was sound, and at least on paper, a pastor is a much more trustworthy investment manager than a banker, and there was evidence that business was booming. Gray, meanwhile, took to a local radio station to advertise. Billing herself as a personal wealth coach, she would tell potential investors that she had helped people to multiply their money before. Her entire pitch platform was built on past successes that did not exist. Holly and Gray ran the scam through a business meant to manage the investments. Known as Treasure Enterprise LLC, the business was supposed to be a front for managing real estate investments, but in reality, a good chunk of the money was funneled back to Holly and Gray. Much of it was also used for the benefit of the church. In typical Ponzi scheme fashion, of course, some of the cash made its way back to older investors. Holly and Gray would have people fill out cards showing their current financial holdings to get a better feel for who was ripe for scamming. They would pray with their flock over these cards and pull aside certain potential suckers to talk in more detail about what treasure could do for them. In many cases, people were encouraged to yank money out of more legitimate investments, or even take out personal loans that Holly promised to pay back for them. Alongside all of this, Gray's catches through her financial coaching hustle began to find a type. When all this was going on, the local auto factory scene was going through major changes. A significant number of people were getting laid off, making their severance packages ripe for the picking. These folks, much like the scam's main targets, had lumps of cash sitting around. Treasure's real estate portfolio was vast, made up mostly of commercial properties that could be rented out or otherwise milked for a stream of income. On paper, these investments and their returns were supposed to power the promised 7-10% to returns that Holly and Gray were presenting to investors in the beginning. That number would jump well into the 20% range before it was all said and done. The high promised returns were appealing, but a lot of the people scammed were vulnerable and in need of something secure. Holly and Gray were happy to oblige. The pair promised that each investment would go through a period of use where investors would be getting interest payments. Then, when that was over, the principal would be returned. They also told investors that Treasure had plenty of cash on hand in case anybody wanted to bow out early, which was a blatant lie. As an added layer of false security, Holly and Gray promised that investments would be placed into retirement accounts, which held some tax exemptions and potential for extra returns in the form of interest. That didn't happen. Instead, when Holly put the money directly into Treasure's business accounts, he passed tax liability onto the investors, financially straining many of them. One investor who took out about $500,000 in personal loans to put into the scam ended up having to file bankruptcy in 2016. The way that Holly and Gray were painting everything, investors were in for some easy cash flow. Treasure had some legitimate investments, so maybe that was, to some extent, the original plan. Naturally, that did not end up being the case. Holly and Gray pulled massive amounts of money straight out of treasure for their own gain. The two reportedly put out 600000 right into
into their own pockets throughout the course of the scam. A big chunk of the money also went into keeping abundant life afloat. The real estate investments themselves were real, but they weren't panning out nearly as well as the scammers had hoped. It's possible that the original plan was to sit back and collect rent checks and interest, but what actually happened was that the investments failed spectacularly. Treasure and other companies with ties to Holly had dozens of properties, and they all ended up in the hands of authorities. When investments started floundering, investors stopped getting their promised payouts. At first, the scammy duo kept things smooth by making excuses and further promises, along with the occasional payment using new investors' money. In 2017, people began complaining loudly and publicly, and this got the attention of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. The fact that the scammers had never registered with the SEC and had no business hawking securities was more than enough to spur the commission into decisive action. In March of that year, the commission made a civil filing against the pair. The investigation turned up 142 victims who had collectively lost out on an eye-watering $9 million. This, of course, was just what they had lost. It didn't even touch the amounts that were promised by Holly and Gray. As if the ship wasn't already sinking fast enough, the commercial properties held by Treasure fell behind on their taxes. This meant that they ended up on the county rolls for foreclosure and sale to recover back taxes. An asset freeze along with various orders keeping Gray and Holly from continuing business and plotting together put the whole thing underwater. In 2018, the case was brought into federal court. Proceedings dragged on as they had every step of the way. After all, there was a lot to unpack here. Just how much of the business was legitimate? How much damage did the two cause? What information could they give to help recover assets? And what could be done for the victims? Holly and Gray pleaded guilty in 2019 and both received prison sentences. Holly was doomed to serve about eight years in prison, while Gray got a four-year sentence for her part. With both of them barred from conducting further business of the sort that got them into trouble, they'll be virtually unable to reoffend upon getting out. Holly's attorney, however, has laid out a challenge to the sentence. According to him, Holly's health is failing and he requires care that he can only get on the outside. This means that his sentence is essentially a death sentence and is thus a violation of due process. Additionally, he claimed that Holly had no malicious intent and didn't see any personal gain. Instead, the attorney said that Holly was moving the money around in unorthodox and risky ways because of his confidence in its return and increase. As of this writing, both scammers are still in prison despite the challenge. Number two, scamming again. Kent Whitney, a former options trader out of California, built at least $33 million from unsuspecting investors by starting a fake church. He did this hand in hand with one David Lee Parrish who had helped with a previous scam. That previous investment scam raked in about 600 grand, but also got Whitney 44 months in jail. He had also suffered temporary brokering bans in the past due to margin call fraud, wherein he took steps to avoid telling people whose accounts he managed that they were getting low on funds. Whitney used his previous position in the investment space to lure investors under false pretenses. This time, however, he took a slightly different approach. He became a pastor. Even so, in the typical investment scam fashion, the money went almost nowhere but his own pockets. When authorities busted the whole thing open, they have only managed to track down $4.3 million of the missing funds thus far. Whitney began laying the groundwork for his fake church while he was in prison. It all came to fruition in August of 2014 when he went through an online program to become an ordained minister. From there, he established an online church with sermons, prayer requests, and more, all managed from a rented space in a strip mall. The Church for the Healthy Self, or CHS, spent 2014 to 2018 swelling its ranks and hawking a phony investment program. In 2018, Parrish joined up as a pastor and things kicked into high gear. The local Vietnamese community was targeted in particular, with the church even putting out a TV commercial about their church and investment program in Vietnamese. The two running the show claimed the investments had an income tax incentive and were even insured by the FDIC. Obviously, this didn't end up being the case. Before the SEC swooped in and shut it down, Whitney and Parrish had promised investors 12% returns on YouTube, continued seeking funding after the FBI froze their assets, and even convinced one unfortunate investor to transfer their long-running IRA to the church. The SEC put in an official complaint against CHS in 2019. By 2020, the matter was in front of a federal judge. The case ended up being pretty cut and dried. Both fake pastors pled guilty in the end to multiple charges, Whitney being the ringleader and main perpetrator in this newest scam, and a previous one, got the harsher sentence, 14 years in federal prison. Parrish, meanwhile, was sentenced to one year and three days, along with three years of supervised release. Number one, churches only. 
Coming around to our last story, we're flipping the script. Instead of a pastor running scams, we've got a guy that ran scams on churches. Florida man Philip Conley defrauded a number of churches throughout West Virginia among other entities with fake investment accounts. It wasn't that hard for somebody with his background. Up until 2014, he was a broker with finance giant Merrill Lynch. A previous crime saw his license get taken away in 2015, but authorities couldn't take away his industry know-how. West Virginia State Attorney William J. Illenfeld II dug in deep to get the details on Conley's exploits. He managed to drum up millions of dollars from victims in a number of areas, but he did it all using fairly ordinary tactics. The main thing that set him apart from other scammers of his kind was his knack for falsifying documents, leading would-be investors to believe that they were putting their cash into something of real value. He did it all under the front of Alpax LLC, a company that he put together after leaving Merrill Lynch. Just about anybody can register for an LLC these days, so he didn't need accomplices to make his newest scam look legit. All he had to do was print up convincing documents on company letterhead that pointed to lucrative, high-value investments. The fake investments included things like timber releases and student housing construction. He would show these to victims to get them on board, but when it came time to pay out, he would always come up dry. In most Ponzi schemes, you have to throw a little bit back at older investors to keep them from suspecting anything. Somehow, Conley managed to skip that step and keep the scam running until 2020. When the hammer dropped on Conley, it dropped hard. There was initially talk of much larger judgments and longer sentences, but the scammer ultimately got about seven years for his troubles. Alongside the prison time, he was ordered to forfeit anything he bought with his ill gotten gains. Since he got away with about $5 million and only some $200,000 made its way back to investors, his high on the hog life came crashing down in just as grand a fashion as he lived it. Naturally, a monetary judgment was thrown in for good measure. Conley's been ordered to fork over roughly $4.8 million, which would just about square up the amount he took versus the amount he already gave back. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you think is worst prosperity preachers or call center scammers.